Yep. Cool. All right. Uh, my name is Eli Lennington, and I did Chapter 19, Sporting Goods and Licensed Products. Okay, in this chapter, uh, they focus on two main subjects, sporting goods and licensed products. Uh, there were three product categories that compose these sporting goods, uh, and that's equipment, athletic footwear, and apparel. Uh, the largest trade association that assists sporting good professionals is the SGMA, the Sporting Goods Manufacturing Association. Uh, George Tyrone, in 1811, found, or, uh, found a niche with people interested in sport. Uh, after expanding to the, uh, into the fishing tackle business, Tyrone's company became a major wholesaler of sporting goods east of the Mississippi. It wasn't until Rawlings in 1888 that a company had promoted itself as a full-line emporium of all sporting goods. Albert G. Spalding, Type 5, the early sporting goods entrepreneur, he loaned $800 to create a sporting goods manufacturing giant focused on selling to the expanding middle class of the United States. Spalding would adopt technological advances to manufacture bats, baseballs, gloves, uniforms, golf clubs, bicycles, hunting goods, and football equipment. It wasn't until the 20th century that famous athletes began to endorse sporting goods. In the late, uh, 1980s and 90s, the industry saw an emergence of companies such as Nike and Reebok. In the late 80s, with the advent of Air Jordan and Bo Nose, Nike had topped the charts and was a $2 billion company by 1990. Licensing agreements came around 1990. The industry didn't realize the financial potential initially. The NFL was the first professional league to develop a properties component in 1963. The MLB, NHL, and NBA would follow. The MLB formatted the MLB Players Association and had an agreement the first of its kind. Then in, the 2000, or then in 2000, the NFL and the NFL Players Association entered a unique partnership that provides group licenses to format. In today's day and age, endorsements and licensed products are nothing new. Today, major college and university sports programs are paid to provide equipment, footwear, and apparel from top sports brands, Nike, <coughs> Adidas, Under Armour, Russell, etc. I threw Russell in there for Ohio U. Let's go. Uh, an example, the University of Texas baseball team is endorsed by Nike for apparel, for apparel and footwear. We're also endorsed by Louisville Slugger for their bats and gloves. Uh, the NFL is now partnered with Nike for its apparel and footwear. It also has a contract with New Era, um, which is a hat company, uh, for off-field head, off headwear. The MLB is partnered with Majestic for their uniforms. It also has a partnership with Nike for fan apparel. Uh, New Era also provides them with their on-field headwear. The NBA is partnered with Adidas for their apparel and for their uniforms. Uh, challenging issue. Collegiate athletes are forced to wear the apparel and footwear that their uh, school or team is endorsed by. A few years ago, there was an issue with Michael Jordan's son when he was at uh, UCF, University of Central Florida. Um, the team at that point in time was sponsored by Adidas and he wanted to wear his father's shoe. Um, they didn't like that and Adidas soon dropped the partnership with the school. Uh, career implications. This information can impact my career if I get involved in sporting goods or licensing for a sports team. Uh, if I do get a position with one of these, uh, the sports industry, I would have to follow the rules of the SGMA, which I mentioned earlier. And I would also have to obey the rules of the contract between the team that I work for and the company that endorses them. That's it. Cool. Go. All right. We did youth and high school sports. Jerry Salisbury, Jake Nolan. Um, a little bit of history. Um, youth athletic participation. Uh, it, it predates the uh, signing of the Constitution. The uh, first sport that was created. Supposedly, was lacrosse. Um, it was created by the uh, Native Americans. Um, European settlers also brought uh, cricket, tennis, and uh, several several early versions of what would become baseball over. Uh, formal organizations didn't form until the mid to late 19th century, and private schools were the first to provide athletic participation. History continued. Um, North Hill School in northern Massachusetts was the first institution known to promote physical well-being. Charles Beck was the uh, first known PE teacher also at North Hill School. Um, in, 1950, in 1859, uh, the first school to promote outside physical activity, which was baseball, um, was Frederick Gunn. In 1878, the first full-time faculty member hired to be a coach. 
1895, there was the first full-time <laughs> athletic director was appointed, and in the 1890s, the first baseball tournaments were held in Boston for youth sports. Boston strong, baby. More history. Um, after World War I, school sports were promoted as a source of physical training for the armed forces without directly encouraging militarism. By 1924, uh, state associations managed high school athletics in all the three states, and sports boosted student retention and graduation rates. Nin and because in 1918, only one third of uh, grade school students went on to high school, and only one in nine of those graduated high school. All right, well, top five boys and girls sports in the year of 2008-2009 was, uh, for boys, it was football and uh, basketball, outdoor track and field, baseball and soccer. For girls, it was outdoor track and field, which is very popular all over the place. Basketball, volleyball, softball, fast pitch, and soccer. Facts about the students who didn't participate in extracurricular activities in high school. 49% uh, were more likely to get involved with drugs and alcohol. 37% were more likely to uh, become a teen parent. The Center for Information and Research on Civic Learning and Engagement, which is known as CIRCLE, found uh, that students who participate in extracurricular activities engage in volunteering, registering to vote, feel more comfortable uh, speaking in public, and are better off in the uh, <coughs> According to the College Entrance Examination Board, students who participated scored 11% higher on their SAT test. Career opportunities um, consisted of hiring, supervising, and evaluating coaches is what both of those guys do. But uh, the differences are the athletic director takes care of risk management, the insurance, employment issues, sexual harassment, gender equity, and fundraising. While the youth league directors sometimes perform their duties on completely voluntary, um, like voluntary coaching, management issues, constant and extreme pressure to perform well, work long and irregular schedules with little or no pay. Gender equity. Administrators are responsible for ensuring that athletic programs treat boys and girls the same, which it, like, kind of goes along with Title IX. Girls play sports essentially the same rate as boys, but in urban areas, only 36% of girls surveyed describe themselves as moderately involved in sports, where uh, guys were like, completely involved in sports. There are also financial differences between su suburban and city girl programs. <coughs> For example, at Middle School 61, a public school in Crown Heights, New York, they pay $80 for uniforms, and only half of the players could pay in full, most paid a couple dollars at a time. Performance-enhancing drugs, which Jerry uses, are known as PEDs. <laughs> there are ethical considerations to using illegal PEDs, such as health risks and the unfair advantage gained by those who use them over the ones who don't. Across the country, efforts are being made to test for and detect the use of PEDs, and testing efforts are in the in the New York Times, which was reported by Jared Longley. I don't know how to say it for the name of Experts inform athletes about the health factors and ethical considerations of doping. What she said. Industry format are formal organizations, and for example, it's like the National Youth League Organization, which promote participation in particular sports among children. Uh, for example, Little League Baseball in 2010, they came out with four organized little, little league groups, which is like local, which is within the town district, is the uh, area around it. Regions, more like the state, and international is like when Japan comes over here to play. Our guys in the Little League see it. All right, so modern challenges um, we found in, in the youth sports um, is there's too much focus on winning. Um, the parents become obsessed with the thought of winning and their child doing well, performing well. So that creates pressure from the parents, and then you also have parents coaching who then play favorites, and their kid plays more, and their kid's the best. So 
That's the, the issues we found. And uh, yeah, nice. Next. Should I pause this? <clears throat> or stop uh, it? Yeah, you can just pause you, it. You can stop it, right? Just stop it. Now. All right, uh, my name is Pat File, and I did intercollegiate athletics. All right, uh, early years in the formation of the NCAA, the first college athletic event was a crew race between Harvard and Yale on August 3rd, 1852. And uh, William Wood, in 1864, became the first college coach for a sports team and he was the coach for the Yale crew team. And uh, football rapidly became the most popular sport and all the Ivy League schools were the power schools, and they created the Intercollegiate Football Association to establish fair rules regarding football in 1876. And uh, because of lack of protection and the increasing death of players in 1905, 13 school presidents met to re reform the game of football and form the Intercollegiate Athletic Association of the United States. And seven years later, they formed the National Collegiate Athletic Association, which we now call the NCAA. All right, the Carnegie Reports and the Knight Commission. The, the Carnegie Reports of 1929 revealed that, the, that a lot of universities abused academics and recruiting procedures and realized there were no rules against such actions. And they had to change the rules and protect amateurism. And the Knight Commission was created to save the in, in integrity of college sports, and they sought, to, they sought to reform rules by helping the government legislation pass numerous rules regarding recruiting, academic standards, and financial practices. All right, women in intercollegiate athletics. The first basketball game was played between Cal Berkeley and Stanford in 1896, and the Association for for intercollegiate athletics for women was established in 1971, and the NCAA decided to add women's sports in 1981, and the AIAW dissolved in 1982 due to decrease of schools. And since 1981, women's sports participation has risen from 74,239 to 182,503 athletes in 08 and 09. And women's basketball plays a big role in college sports today and brings in a lot of money through schools and the NCAA. Gino Ariana is the coach of the Connecticut Huskies team and he makes $1.3 million in, in, in annual salary. <clears throat> All right, the structure and governance of the NCAA. The NCAA is a voluntary association which consists of over 1,200 insti institutions, conferences, and individual members. And it's divided into three three divisions, Division One, Two, II, and Three. And the purpose of the NCAA is to maintain intercollegiate athletics as an integral part of the education program and athlete as an integral part of the student body. And retain a clear line between intercollegiate athletics and professional sports. And the NCAA consists of many committees, including the Legislation and, Go and Governments Committee, Academics Committee, the enforcement community which enforces the laws of the NCAA to its members. <clears throat> All right, um, Division One. most of the athletic programs, they're larger than Division Two and Three, and they support com competitiveness through sport and generate revenue through ath athletics and national success. The football teams are also divided into two, uh, like, a, so associations the FBS and the FCS. Schools in the FBS require a minimum attendance at, at their games, and the school must, must sponsor six, 16 teams, and the, F, the FCS requires no, no minimum of, uh, attendance at their games. Division two is smaller than the FBS schools and generally attract in-state students you, that look for a partial scholarship. And Division three allows no athletic scholarship, and they emphasize the player more than Spectator. All right, conferences. And uh, in order to be a conference, you need to have a, at least six members within the same division. And one advantage of being in a conference is the ability to generate revenue through sponsorships, TV contracts, and football bowl games. 
and uh, <coughs> through the Big Ten network, each school within the Big Ten conference received $22 million in 2009. And one problem with conferences is the conference realignment process. Schools can choose to realign because of revenue through TV contracts and conference championship games. And many notable realignments include the collapse of the Southwestern Football Conference, Jesus the changes in the Big East Conference, and the creation of the American Athletic Conference last year. Just fucking rude. All right, one current issue, it's not really an issue, but it's like a challenge. Uh, the Northwestern football team are trying to form a, a uh, players union, and the National Labor Relations Board recognized them as in employees and now the players will vote whether if they want to un to unionize or not and this means the players at Northwestern can negotiate with the NCAA and get more benefits and this would only work at private schools like Northwestern because they are recognized by the NLRB and the state schools they're recognized by state labor laws and it wouldn't work and this could change the dynamic of amateur athletics forever career implication. Uh, this uh, helped me grasp the bigger picture of this one part of the world of sports, and I've learned it'd be much harder to get a job in the sport industry. That's it. All right. I did recreational sport. I learned out Bluebird. All right, so the big question comes to recreational sports is mainly why <coughs> would people do recreational sports for fun, time, relaxation, social interactions, challenge, lifestyle enhancement for exercise, stuff like that. Another question is how, and then we have direct and indirect participation, indirect participation, because I'm actually playing in the recreational sports, and indirect participation would be just attending some things. Uh, the present history of uh, recreational sports, uh, the most, I guess the very first was the parks movement, and that was the establishment of public lands, such as like Central Park in New York, where the community can go and can hang out and do stuff. Uh, as well as new technology is very present in our age. Uh, allowing new activity in sports we've won, such as like bicycle and golf ball. Uh, allowing exploration of new geological and cultural sites as well, such as like national parks, national seashores, and stuff like that. Uh, the format of recreational sport industry, pretty much. Uh, mainly like what was the outcome of the recreational movement, which was the actual establishment. Uh, we had formal and national organizations and associations, such as like one example of a formal organization would be summer and religious camps, and a national association would be like the American Canadian Association and Boy Girl Scouts as well, and this spread nationally for everyone to, everybody to get involved. Uh, one modern challenge, which is very big, is the new technology. Um, kind of one challenge with this is what else is there? How far can we go when the sports can be created pretty much, uh, and how much growth is left in the industry. We've already come so far and just kind of waiting for someone to come up with a new technology to push one step further. Uh, and then mainly, is technology separating the men from the boys? Because with recreational sports, everyone knows the dream of going professional. Well, with new technology, you know, access to that new technology, new way of training, stuff like that, kind of separates those who have the opportunity to pursue that sport. Uh, aspirations. How will this information be present used in like, my career aspirations? Uh, well, we have <coughs> many different types of recreation, I guess. We have community-based, public, military, outdoor, university, and therapeutic. Uh, me, personally, I was looking at outdoor and therapeutic, uh, <coughs> sports medicine, something like that. And I've been with all these different fields, there's many opportunities to pursue. Uh, how the industry basically formed um, one big issue, well, not a big issue, one thing you must do is you take advantage of your skills. Uh, you have to find a job, finding a job, with, finding a recreation job requires a general understanding of all segments of the industry and a sense of where expansion is occurring or is likely to occur. So you have to actually do your own research kind of stuff. But, uh, industry format continue, how to approach the professional, professional preparation. Well, we have two main ways. And one is in the actual recreational field, which is also known as the skills approach, and that enables a person to obtain training and experience through organizations such as NLLS, uh, National Outdoor Leadership Schools. And another way 
is the academic program, which is a curriculum-based approach. Uh, curriculum is designed around a specific field, such as this sport management program at our university. Uh, one challenging issue with, sport with recreational sports uh, is changing factors in our society, such as demographic trends, financial constraints, uh, deteriorating parks and recreational infrastructures, because nothing lasts forever, as we say, a natural park goes away, but it is that. Uh, and uh, as well as the government, between the federal, state, and local governments, uh, they've, all, they've all reduced their uh, proportionate shares in uh, recreational budgets, which is the government no longer funds certain recreational sports, which is a huge issue. Um, as well as career applications, where to start? Personally, you must find an interest. Whatever interest you can get to pursue that. Uh, prepare both mentally and physically, as not all of us take the books. Uh, and compare demographics uh, with interest and figure out what's the best. Sometimes it's best for you is exactly what you want to do, but wherever your skills lie, that's where they are. Uh, and how will you fit in this process? Well, you know, if you find what you want to do, you can find a way to make it work and already involved in the curriculum and skill based approach. It's one step. That's what I got. I'm Jeremy Sigler, and I'm presenting my sports production segment presentation project. I am from the NFC West Cardinals group, and I am doing half of my presentation, and Steve Jarmelio, my partner, is doing the other half. And my part is professional sports. Professional sports. North America is home to the five prominent sports leagues. So a professional sports league. There's the NFL the NHL, the, um, the NBA, and made the MLS. The five most prominent sports leagues in the world are all in North America. As of 2010, five of, like, in the five of those leagues, there was 138 franchises. Each year, new leagues form, like the NLL, the National Lacrosse League, the... Uh, the uh, the Major League Lacrosse League, the Lacrosse League for Girls, uh, the WNBA, the Women's National Basketball Association. New leagues form all the time. Some survive, and some leagues don't survive. A little history. In 1869, the Cincinnati Red Stockings were the first professional team in sports. Back then in the day, the Red Stockings paid their team, their 10 players, $9,300 which came out to an average of $930 per player, and the national salary for an average American back in the day was $170. In, in 1876, the National League was the first professional sports league in America. And, the, uh, and still today, like, people, like, sports leagues have taken off the values that they had back then, back in the 1800s. Kind of cool. All right, franchise and ownership. The NFL, in the NFL family, individuals or ownerships, in the NFL, family or individuals own teams. The focus on the team is more, it's not like a hobby, it's more of a business in the facts of the NFL. They run their, they run their organizations more to, to make money as an entrepreneurship, more so as a hobby. Owners have paid varying amounts to clubs, like uh, Daniel Snyder paid $800 million for the Washington Redskins. Bob Snyder paid $700 million for the uh, Baltimore Ravens. Jerry Jones paid $140 million for the Dallas Cowboys. And uh, oh, Mike Brown, he uh, got the Cincinnati Bengals for free. <laughs> and the owners don't actually own the logos. So, like the logo, logos are all owned by the NFL Trust organization. The NFL Trust organization spreads revenue throughout the teams with for the logos. The rules of ownership: not anyone can just own a team or a franchise. You have to first have very financially deep pockets, and second, you have to be put on. You have to give, like, you have to be granted permission by the ownership committee of the league that you're trying to get into. Each team has franchise rights that governs their own property. They also have territorial rights, so no other team can just move into their city or their territory without permission granted from their league and without getting comprehension to the rights holder of that area. Also, revenue sharing gives each team its portion of the league's 
wide revenue of the national television revenue and the gate receipts and licensing revenue. The NFL is a very strict league and has banned corporate ownership, public ownership, and cross ownership. Ownership of more than one sports franchise. So if you're in the NFL, you can only own one organization. Finally, the commissioner. The commissioner's job is pretty much to do what is in the best interest for his respective league. The commissioner uh, has the powers uh, to approve contracts. He has to resolve uh, issues between players and clubs, between clubs and clubs, and between the club or player and the league. Uh, modern day commissioners are concerned with marketing just as much as they're concerned with disciplinary action. So everything's moving towards a marketing scheme. And uh, Pete Rose is being held out of the Hall of Fame by one of the worst commissioners of all time. Let him in, Bud Seelig. Let Pete Rose in. He deserves it. He ultimately deserves it. And career implications. Uh, I'm going to graduate Ohio University with a major in exercise physiology and a minor in sports administration. And I plan to get my master's in the coaching edu education program. After a while, after working for a sports organization, I would like to move up to be a general team manager, which I read about. Like, I would like to be able to have focus on the players, the club organization, all the trades that they make, and everything like that. And that's what I would like to do. And that's going to be my presentation. I'm Steve Jaramello, and uh, this is a sports production segmentation presentation. Uh, we did it on professional sports. I'm part of the NFC West Cardinals. My partner is Jeremy Sigler. He did the first part and I did this part, which is the second portion. The industry format. Uh, for pro professional sport leagues, uh, it has a self-governed system. The commissioner does not have direct power over the owners. Uh, his power is um, the fact that he has decision-making power disciplinary action and dispute resolution authority. Basically he decides if someone did something wrong in the league that reflects the whole league he has to take care of it and within his powers. Also in the industry there's the players association which represents this players opinion so they are not misrepresented. The revenues through the league are made through national television, radio contracts, league-wide sponsorship, and then also league-wide licensing. Team revenues are by local broadcasting, gate receipts, seating sales, and then stadium revenues. So that's how they earn their money. The challenging issue is the Players Association. Uh, the Players Association is where the players came together so that the league management would not make unilateral decisions. Unilateral decisions are basically the fact that the players had no say and then the league just did whatever they wanted. So now that they have this, they have something called collective bargaining agreement. It's bargaining so the players, players are paid what they're worth. So things that they would uh, bargain about are the hours, wages, terms, conditions of their employment that the players have. Career implications. I plan on graduating from Ohio University with sports management major. I would love to work for an NFL association, preferably the Cleveland Browns. After reading this article, I see how the industry has changed over time and I feel that there's great opportunity to get a job in this industry. It's been growing since it's been going, so it's only ways to go up. So, With the reading this article, I've also learned that there are a lot of ways to earn money in this uh, industry so whether I start from the bottom to work my way up I would love to get a job in this uh, career <laughs>